The Soul is Not a Smithy by David Foster Wallace Part 2. Mr. Johnson, originally of nearby Urbancrest, was later revealed to have no record of mental disturbance or criminal behavior of any kind, according to press accounts. It had last snowed in early March. The classroom window's eastward view, in other words, was primarily mud and dirty snow. What sky there was was colorless and rode somewhat low, like something sodden or quite tired. The ball field's infield was all mud, with only a small hyphen of snow atop the pitcher's rubber. Usually, throughout second period, the window's only real movement was litter or a vehicle of some sort on Taft, with the day of the trauma's exception being the appearance of the dogs. It had happened only once before, earlier in the Constitution unit. But not again until now, the two dogs entered the window's upper right grid from a copse of trees to the northeast and proceeded diagonally down towards the northern goal area of the soccer fields. They then began moving in gradually diminishing circles around each other, apparently preparing to copulate. A similar scenario had unfolded once before, but the dogs had not reappeared for some weeks. Their actions appeared to be consistent with those of mating. The larger of the two dogs mounted the other's back from the rear and wrapped its forelegs around the brindle-colored dog's body and began to thrust repeatedly, taking a series of tiny steps with its large rear legs as the other dog attempted to escape. This occupied slightly more than one square of the window's wire mesh. The visual impression was of one large anatomically complex dog having a series of convulsions. It was not a pretty sight, but it was vivid and compelling. One of the animals was larger and black with a dun chest element, possibly a Rottweiler mix, though it lacked a purebred Rottweiler's breadth of head. The breed of the smaller dog beneath it was unidentifiable. According to my older brother, we had had a dog for a short period when I would have been too young to remember, which had chewed on the base of the piano and the legs of a spectacular 16th century antique Queen Elizabeth dining room table our mother had discovered at a rummage sale, which was worth over $1 million when appraised and caused the family dog to have disappeared one day when my brother came home from nursery school and found both the dog and the table missing adding that my parents had been very upset about the whole business and that if I ever brought the dog up or asked our mother about it and upset her, he would put my fingers in the hinge of the foyer closet and lean with all his weight on the door until all my fingers were so mangled they would have to be amputated and I would be even more hopeless at the piano than I already was. Both my brother and I had been involved in intensive piano instruction and recitals at that juncture though it was only he who had showed true promise and had continued twice a week with Mrs. Doudna until his own difficulties began to emerge so dramatically in early adolescence. The conjoined dogs were too distant to ascertain whether they had collars or tags, yet close enough that I could make out the expression on the face of the dominant dog above. It was blank and at the same time fervid, the same general expression as on a human being's face when he is doing something that he feels compulsively driven to do and yet does not understand just why he wants to do it. Rather than mating, it could have been one dog merely asserting its dominance over another, as I later learned was common. It appeared to last a long time, during which the dog on the receiving end underneath took a number of small, unsteady steps which bore both animals across four different panels of the fourth row down complicating the storyboard activity on either side. A collar and tags comprise a valid sign that the dog has a home and owner rather than being a stray animal, which a guest speaker from the public health department in homeroom had explained could be a concern. This was especially true of the rabies vaccination tag required by Franklin County Ordinance for obvious reasons. The unhappy but stoic expression on the face of the brindle-colored dog beneath was harder to characterize. Perhaps it was less distinct or obscured by the window's protective mesh. Our mother had once described the expression of our Aunt Tina, who had profound physical problems, as this long-suffering. Mary Unterbrunner, known also by Oemke and Llewellyn's group on the playground as Big Bertha, was the only other girl who sometimes ever played with Mandy Blem after school hours. My brother, who was in the same class as Mandy Blem's elder sister Brandy, said that the Blems were well known to be a disturbed family whose father always stayed home all day in just his undershirt, and their yard looked like a junkyard, and their German shepherd would try to kill you if you even came near the Blems fence, and that once when Brandy didn't clean up the dog's droppings, which was apparently her assigned chore, allegedly the father came angrily staggering out and made her lie down in the yard and put her face in the droppings. 
My brother said that two different seventh graders had seen this, and it was why Brandy Blen, who was also somewhat slow, was known around Fishinger Secondary as the shit girl, which surely could not have felt good for a girl in her early teen years to be called, no matter how much she did or did not have on the ball. The only other time at which Mr. Johnson had substituted for the real teacher in any of my classes had been for two weeks in second grade when Mrs. Claymore, our homeroom teacher, had been in a traffic accident and came back with a large white metal and canvas brace around her neck, which no one was allowed to sign and could not turn her head to either side for the remainder of the school year, after which time she retired to Florida with independent means. As I remember him, Mr. Johnson was of average height for an adult, with a standard crew cut, suit jacket and necktie, and eyeglasses with scholarly black frames that everyone who wore glasses in that day and age wore. Evidently, he had subbed for several other grades and classes at Arby Hayes as well. The only time anyone had ever seen him outside school was one time when Denise Cohn and her mother saw Mr. Johnson in the AMP, and Denise said his cart had been full of frozen foods which her mother had associated with the fact that he was unmarried. I do not recall noticing whether Mr. Johnson wore a wedding band or not, but the dispatch articles later made no mention of his being survived by a wife after the authorities stormed the classroom. I also do not remember his face except as it existed in a dispatch photo afterwards, which was evidently taken from one of his own student yearbooks several years prior. Barring some obvious problem or characteristic, most adults' faces were not easy to attend to closely at that age. Their very adultness obscured all other characteristics. To the best of my recollection, Mr. Johnson's was a face whose only memorable characteristic was that it appeared slightly tilted or angled upwards in its position on the front of his head. This was not excessive, but only a matter of one or two degrees. Imagine holding up a mask or portrait so that it was facing you and then tilting it one or two degrees upwards off of normal center. As if, in other words, its eye holes were now looking slightly upwards, and that this, together with what was either poor posture or a problem involving his neck, like Mrs. Claymore, caused Mr. Johnson to look as if he were wincing or slightly recoiling from whatever he was saying. It was not gross or obvious, but both Caldwell and Todd Llewellyn had noticed Mr. Johnson's wincing quality, too, and remarked on it. Llewellyn said the sub looked like he was scared of his own shadow, like Miles O'Keefe or Gunsmoke's Festus, who we all hated. Nobody ever wanted to be Festus in recreations of Gunsmoke. On his first day substituting for Mrs. Roseman, he introduced himself to us as Mr. Johnson, writing it on the chalkboard in perfect Palmer cursive, as did all teachers of that time. But as his full name recurred so often in the dispatch for several weeks after the incident, he tends to remain now more in my memory as Richard Allen Johnson, Jr., 31, originally of nearby Urbancrest, which is a small bedroom community outside of Columbus proper. According to my brother's own flights of fancy in childhood, the antique table we had possessed before I was old enough to be aware of anything that was going on had been burled walnut, with a large number of diamonds, sapphires, and rhinestones inset in the top in the likeness of the face of Queen Elizabeth I of England. 1533 to 1603, as seen from the right side, and that the disappointment of its loss was part of the reason our father often looked so unhappy on coming home at the end of the day. The easternmost row's second-to-last desk had a deep stick figure with a cowboy hat and much oversized six-shooter gouged deeply into it and colored in with ink from some previous fourth grader, obviously the product of much slow, patient effort over the course of the year. Directly ahead of me were the thick neck, upper vertebrae, and severely bobbed hairline of Mary Unterbrunner, whose neck's pale and patternless freckles I had studied for almost two years as Mary Unterbrunner, who would later become an administrative secretary at the large women's detention center in Parma, had also been in my third grade homeroom with Mrs. Taylor, who read the class ghost stories and could play the ukulele and was a great deal of fun as a homeroom teacher so long as you didn't get on the wrong side of her temper. Mrs. Taylor once hit Caldwell on the back of his hand with her ruler, which she carried in the large kangaroo pocket of her smock, so hard that it swelled up almost like a cartoon hand. And Mrs. Caldwell, who knew judo, and who you also did not want to fool around with in terms of her own temper, according to Caldwell, came down to the school to complain to the principal.
What teachers in the administration in that era never appeared to see was that the mental work of what they called daydreaming often required more effort and concentration than it would have taken simply to listen in class. Laziness is not the issue. It is just not the work dictated by the administration. 